So my name is Jeremy Allison, and I'm a member of Google's Open Source Program Office. I'm also on the Samba team. And I just want to do a disclaimer at the beginning, um, as I like to do, because I, I, I like my job. Um, no Google lawyers have seen this presentation. No Google people uh, were involved, etc. This is kind of an external presentation. I'm lucky in that because I, I do Samba work um, on behalf of Google, I, I get to wear two hats. And this hat is not with my Google hat on. This is definitely with my Samba hat on. So, you know, whatever I say here, how, however contentious, I, please, I don't want to see in the press sort of, Google engineer says, um, or, I'm, uh, or I'm out of a job. And I, I, I say, I like my job. And there's so. enough of Google engineers say. There, there indeed. <laughs> there's, 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 and I, and I, I promise not to, not to leak anything. Um, but anyway, there's, a lot, there's too many Google engineers say right now. So anyway. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of a mixed bag because um, I sit on in two worlds. Um, I do Samba, um, and I also work with people who use Samba and, and open source as part of their storage project, uh, products. And so this is, this is kind of a, a, a mixed talk in which I'll talk about how Samba handles security and security flaws. And I'll also talk about how you might want to handle security yourself if you are doing a storage product that uh, includes some open source code. Not necessarily Samba. This is not a Samba specific talk. Although I will get to some juicy details later on because that's the only reason why anyone comes to a security talk is to hear the catastrophes. Uh, and I promise you I have some of those. So I, I think it's a bold statement, but I think it's true. Um, all new storage products will use open source in some uh, way, shape, or form or another. Uh, and it's, it's literally economics, uh, unless you are Google, Apple, Microsoft, really. Uh, nobody's writing new operating systems. Um, Linux or FreeBSD really are your choices for an underlying storage stack. Uh, Microsoft uses Windows, but they often layer open source code on top of things. Um, and so what, what does that mean in terms of someone who's creating storage products um, around open source technologies? Well, what it means is that you don't have full control over everything that goes into your product that you're shipping to customers that you are ultimately responsible for. Uh, I say, unless you employ Linus. But actually, even if you employ Linus, <laughs> um, who step back these days, um, you, you really won't have full control over what goes into your product. You won't be able to review every line of code. It doesn't matter how many engineers you have. Um, so you're going to end up getting some surprises. It might be uh, some unpleasant security surprises. It might be because of code that your own engineers have created. It might be code that um, you've imported in as part of your open source process. Um, and I, if anyone wants to uh, I can talk a little bit about how Google does this. We have a very established process about bringing open source in. Um, but you, you must, you have to understand that you're, you're not going to be able to control everything. And so what that means is you have to have a process to handle security. If you don't, you end up, um, in the case of um, vendors who actually, uh, I think it was last week, I'm not going to name any names, but were surprised by some Security, security researchers publishing vulnerabilities in their products that essentially means all of the storage that they sold to everyone is freely available over the internet, um, which is not good. Um, and that's because no matter how large they were, they obviously didn't have a process to coordinate with open source upstream, uh, to get heads up about security problems, to learn about issues, to do something about it, to have a process for fixing things. So you know, even if you can't fix it yourself, you need to know about problems in the code that you are using in your own products. So how do you deal with upstream projects like Samba, for instance? Um, first of all, do you actually know that the open source code that you're using inside your product is from a vendor or, or a project that actually takes security seriously? Uh, and that's not always as common as you might think. Um, lots of um, open source projects are, are 
amateur run. They're a bunch of people doing something that they find fun. You know, they're writing code that they find amusing and interesting. And no one ever thought about, you know, the freight train of a security vulnerability coming down the tracks. Uh, and so they don't know what to do. They panic. They deny it. They hide it. Um, so there was a great talk, I think it was given by Martin Mikos, saying security is everybody's responsibility. That was at um, a Linux Foundation event in Napa earlier this year. Um, I, I would recommend that talk. I thought he did a really good job of it. He, essentially, he said, it's everybody's fault and everybody's responsible, which you know, kind of paraphrase. Um, so everyone has to participate in this. And the other thing you have to think about is even projects that do security well, and I would like to think that Samba does security well, even we have dependencies. So I would be pretty confident to say that Samba file server, the SMB server in Samba, has a security process. Um, I, I'm, we've dealt with some fairly critical, bug, critical bugs, which I will talk about later on. Um, and we have a great process of a, we, all right, we have a process. <laughs> I'd like to say great, but we, that's, not my, that's not me to, uh, to say. We have a process for dealing with security vulnerabilities. I'm confident that we can manage security vulnerabilities. Having said that, we also ship an Active Directory domain controller. I am not confident, and I will not say that we have a good security process for dealing with flaws in that. And one of the reasons for that is we have dependencies on upstream projects. The Active Directory domain controller includes Heimdall as a Kerberos um, KDC. Um, KDC is the um, Kerberos um, domain controller. It's the piece that holds all the security accounts. We didn't write that code, although we import it as a third party piece. We try and keep it up to date. We try and review it for security vulnerabilities. It's a massive chunk of code that we didn't write that we ship as part of our upstream vulnerabilities. It's not well maintained. Um, we're trying to rebase on top of MIT, Kerberos, which is also not well maintained, but has at least <laughs> a better process for handling security. Um, but that's a long and hard job, uh, simply because they don't have that many engineers either. So while I would be very confident in the file server, I am not going to stand behind you and say, yes, we will immediately fix all security flaws in the Active Directory domain controller. So be aware of that. So you must know what's going into your storage. And as I already mentioned um, about the vendor last week, if you get it wrong, it's a disaster. Um, although, having said that, <laughs> you know, uh, if anyone's seen that cartoon of Equifax and the dog sitting in the burning building saying, we are Equifax, this is fine. Uh, security vulnerabilities seem to come out and no one seems to do anything about them and there never seems to be any consequences. So maybe my definition of disaster is, is not, um, is not up to date. So what should you do um, as an open source project, as a vendor? Process, process, process. It's boring. It's tedious. You have to have one. You must be able to handle all security reports coming in uniformly. Everybody gets the same treatment. We have an alias, security at samba.org. We are a volunteer organization. There is theoretically nobody staffing that alias. It actually goes to all the members on the Samba team. Practically, because we are a distributed organization and we have people all around the world in just about every time zone, it's 24-7. Um, you know, I, I check email on weekends. If I see a security report coming in on that alias, um, you will get a ping back. It might not be, oh, we'll fix it immediately, we'll get on this right now. You will get a response. So that's the first sign. Can you make a security report and get an immediate response from the project? Are they listening to you if you've got a problem? Um, the other thing is you need to track security bugs differently from other bugs. You have a bugzilla, whatever, you keep track of, uh, you have uh, source code control. Security, is anyone, anyone not familiar with CVEs or any, anyone, has, anyone not uh, run into CVEs or does anyone know what they are? Great, okay, I'm assuming you will. Uh, you must be able to get hold of CVE numbers to track the bugs and that CVE number must be attached um, you know, with Velcro to everything associated with a bug so that in the future, anyone saying, are we shipping a product that fixed CVE whatever, 
they can track it. They can say, yes, this version of this product that's gone into this particular uh, box has that vulnerability fixed. We know it. Everything is tracked. We can, we can record that. Uh, Linux distros are great. Um, the Samba project tends to use Red Hat security folks who are really, really good. We ping them, and we get back, usually within a day, a CV allocated from their pool. And those are the ones that we generally use for Samba. Um, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, like I say, you, you give the uh, uh, reporter a ping back immediately, but it does have to be consistent. You can't just drop things on the floor. You can't just ignore security reports. If you do, you know, disaster, disaster follows. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't mention it before, but if anyone has any questions or comments um, in the talk, please feel free to, uh, to raise your hands and, uh, and ask. So one yeah. you just mentioned drop on the floor. Um, what kind of turnaround is reasonable? I mean, you expect somebody to answer in the middle of the night on Pacific Coast time because you have somebody in Australia? Or so, um, so SW asks, what, what do you mean by dropped on the floor? What is a reasonable response time for a security issue? So I, I would say you need to get a ping back from the project within, say, 24 hours, um, probably 24 hours business time. So if you report it late on Friday afternoon, um, US time, it's a US-based project, you know, expect to get an answer by the end of Monday. Um, you should have a, at least a, yes, we got your report, we hear you, we'll look into it, some kind of, or yes, somebody already reported this, or there's a fixing, something, you get something back um, within one business day is, is, I think would be reasonable, even, even for a volunteer project. Because if there's nobody monitoring the lists, what if it's a, a security, especially in, in um, storage software, what if it's a, a data corruption bug? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in many ways, that's even worse than a security bug for a, for a storage vendor. So if you're using open source code and somebody's corrupting your data, you would like to get a ping back from the project. So, um, so who, who here has a GPG email account that works? Shame, shame on you all. <laughs> Why Johnny can't encrypt? This is your fault. You are the problem. Sorry, here ends the moralizing. You have to use GPG. Get it, use it, learn it. On my email account at work, I have it set up so that if I send an email that's not GPG encrypted or at least signed, I have to click a, do you want to send this email dialog? Now I click that a lot, <laughs> obviously. But it reminds me that what I'm sending is not secure. People can monitor it. People can read it. It goes through a host of servers that I don't necessarily trust or know. If you are doing security work, you must be able to report via GPG. So if we get a security report, we know it's serious if it came in as a GPG encrypted email. It's like, oh. In fact, my immediate response when I get one of those is, ah, oh, crap, it's a real one. <laughs> Right? <laughs> you know, you get lots of sort of, oh, I did this on Samba and this happened and I think it's a security bug. You're like, well, okay, we'll take a look at it, whatever. You get a GPG encrypted email and you're like, ah, someone's got an exploit. We're hosed. Um, it's important. Your reputation is what matters here. Um, insist on transparency uh, with security researchers. If they have taken the time to research your code, find a problem in it, report it to you, tell them what you're doing about it. Don't say, oh, thank you very much, we'll handle this, um, go away. Um, you need to tell them, okay, we're looking into this. You, you need, what we did in some of our most serious vulnerabilities is we kept the researcher informed. Um, we say, okay, we've gotten this far, we think this is a problem. Um, you know, oh, we had a setback because of this. You just, and you do it via GPG, and you keep, you keep them informed. That way, they understand the process. They don't feel like they're sending security vulnerabilities into a black hole that no one's doing anything about. You're not fooling anybody by doing that. You just create, you're just storing up trouble. It's, it's kind of like not doing the homework. Eventually, eventually the teacher will notice. Um, and, and the lowest of the low uh, are the people who sell vulnerabilities for a living. I hate those people. <laughs> um, and we've had some of those. Uh, essentially, we had people who found vulnerabilities in Samba and have um, 
uh, policy of selling it to people to exploit it and as part of their terms and conditions on the sale and I've seen these is you must never report this to the upstream project <laughs> I hate those people um, you know if, if bad if really really bad things happen to them I'm uh, 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 yes that would be great so, but you, there's nothing you can do about those people they're just they're you know they're more sophisticated versions of the people who smash your car windows to take your radio you know, <laughs> they make more money, but they're the same mentality. And there's nothing you can do about them except get better locks. Um, try and stick to a schedule. Um, and part of that is transparency. If you tell people what you're doing and how long it's taking, at least try and give them an estimate. All right, this is really ugly. We're going to have to do this. If you get setbacks, let them know. Um, Obviously, um, Google's Project Zero uh, sets a strict 90-day schedule. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, try and stick to a schedule. It obviously, it's better if the researcher doesn't give you a, a, a very aggressive schedule or the people who turn up and say, you fix this in three days or I'm going to publish it. Um, anyway, I'll talk about that a little later. But be reliable, be predictable, and be transparent, and that's essentially the way to, to try and be successful in this game. So when you get a security report, you must get a reproducible exploit. You can work without it if they're giving you hints. If it's, if it's a really uh, professional security researcher, they will have done their job, they will have an exploit, they will have code that they can give it to you. You don't have to publish these. When I say full transparency, that doesn't mean you publish to the world, hey, our server sucks and uh, is vulnerable and here's how you exploit it. Um, you, you need a copy of that code, you don't have to publish it. You can hide it in the bugzilla, you can um, you know, keep it GPG encrypted somewhere. Um, don't try and do an easy fix. We've done that in the past. Um, you know, as a young project, that was a great, it's a great feeling. Hey, I saw the bug, I fixed it straight away. It's usually not the right fix, or commonly not the right fix. Take your time, examine what the problem was, and then look for it in every piece of code you have. Because if you found it once, the chances are, it's like, see, like, like when you see one ant, there's never one ant. <laughs> <laughs> they're, always, they're always in your larder or something or running around your kitchen floor. There's never one. If you see one, you know there's, there's thousands of them somewhere else. So look for the issue everywhere. If you do a security release, only fix the security bug or the set of security bugs that you are listing on the CVEs. Make sure you say, this is release you know, 4.x. whatever, and it fixes these CVEs. Do not be tempted, even if you have a data corruption bug, to say, oh, uh, and it also fixes that, and we updated a config file. This is disaster. Uh, we used to do this. We now have a very rigid process. When we do a security bug fix, doesn't matter what other terrible bugs we have in the code that people are suffering from, a security release only fixes security bugs and it only fixes the na CVEs named in there. That way allows uh, downstream vendors, people using the code in their products, to actually have a chance of isolating these issues and taking care of them separately. Um, at least for Samba, uh, we have a long history. We have many, many uh, older versions that are no longer in support. We support the last two versions, security-wise, and the current version. Um, Vendors who are using our code may be shipping versions of the code that are much older, that are out of support. Um, try and help them. I mean, uh, uh, as a project, we don't have the resources to fix a bug that goes all the way back into the past. Now, we do, sometimes that happens. Sometimes a security bug will come up, we'll find that it happened all the way back to 3.0 or something. Um, if there are people shipping products on very old code, um, what we normally do is notify them, and I'll get into how you do that in a little bit. Um, try and help them. You're, it's your code, you are responsible, even if it's out of security maintenance. A really good vendor will have engineers who will actually be paid to do the backports for these kind of things. Um, and, and so I accept their help. Uh, you can act as a central coordination site for the code changes that are needed for a bug, uh, even if you're not writing all the code. Um, oh, um, 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 what was I going to... 
Yes, we actually have a Samba vendors alias. I didn't put this on the slides, I probably should have. We have a Samba vendors alias. If you're using Samba, shipping it in your products, um, what we require is we require individual people, not a mailing list alias, to be on that list and we will notify them of security bugs. So what will happen is a report will come in. The, the process for us is a report will come in, we'll evaluate it, we'll decide it's a security bug, we will work on a fix, see how terrible it is, does it mean the project's dead, Do we, does it mean we have to change certain things? We get to the point where we're pretty satisfied with, with the fix. At that point, we, what's called, open it up to the vendors. So we add the vendor alias to the bug report and we say, hey, we have a security bug coming down the pipeline. Um, you're gonna need to do an update on your products. And at that point, we get feedback from vendors. You have to have contacted us and get put on that list. It's not by magic. We don't know that you're shipping Samba. That's, um, that's, the, way that, um, that, that's the way we communicate. You have to tell us about it. Um, at that point, we can take feedback as to, okay, how long do we have, how long do you need in order to prepare the fix? Um, most cases, we can set a date for the release of about two weeks ahead. So two weeks is usually enough for people to prepare an update, put it in a product, have it available for the customers on the day that the CV is announced. Under certain circumstances, it can take nine months. <laughs> Uh, and I'll, I'll go into those a little later um, when it's a really, really bad problem. So, um, but doesn't, doesn't Coverity and um, Codenomicon and all those guys, don't they save us? Uh, well, and this is more for the open source projects. Un unless you're big and important or like me, you do rent a quote where if you find a bug, I'll give you a quote and they can use it as advertising. Uh, nobody's going to look at your code and do it for free. Um, so... It's really great to have those. And if you are a storage vendor who is using open source code in your product from a project that's too small to get the notice from the big um, security fuzzer vendors and whatever, you would be doing them a great favor if you buy those tools or run those tools, run them yourselves, and feed the upstream bugs back to the project. Um, I would be really, uh, uh, that would be very kind if you, if you were able to do that. The other thing to do that we have is obviously, whenever we find a really, really bad bug, uh, we encode it into our test suite, our continuous integration test suite, um, and we make sure that we don't regress on those things. And, and you have to do that, otherwise you can take, you know, three steps forward, five steps back in, in when you're fixing things. Um, and, if you, are, uh, if you are large enough, important enough to a project, somebody will review the code. It does help catch the worst errors. There are some standardized security coding practices now that, uh, especially in an unsafe language like C that we use or C++, there are some standard practices that essentially people with security in, uh, experience, and unfortunately I'm now getting to the point where I have security experience, when a new patch comes in, I can look at it and go, oh yeah, this is a, I don't even have to know exactly that there is a security problem there. I can look at the code and say, this coding practice could lead to a security flaw in the future. Uh, you need to change it. Uh, and it's usually, um, it's usually to do with something like, essentially it's as simple as adding numbers together. If you ever add two numbers together that came from user input, you have a security flaw. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds really dumb, but it's, it's true. Microsoft have a great process around this. They tell me about it once, but they have more engineers than we do, so. Um, shipping code will soon teach you about this if you, uh, if you don't have it already. So, um, this is how things used to be. I miss those days. Um, back with Samba 1.6 something, and 1.5 dot something, I think it was. Um, somebody first recorded, reported a security flaw on our mailing list, our one mailing list at the time, and Tridge, bless his heart, saw it, immediately stopped mailing list processing, fixed it, pushed the email out as the very next email. He made damn sure the next email was the fix, and then restarted it. And those were the days. It's like, wow, our turnaround was sort of like three minutes. Um, these things are, these days uh, we have over a million lines of code, things are a little more difficult. So, all right, here's the part of the story that, uh, here's the part of the talk that everyone actually turned up for. 
for horrible, horrible security flaws, what they were, how they happened, you know, whose fault was it, all, all, all the dirt. Um, so I'm going to talk about three, because they're really quite interesting flaws. Um, the first one was the bug from hell, the nightmare bug from hell, um, and, and horribly named Badlock. Uh, anyone here familiar with that? Anyone heard of it? Yes? Okay. Not so many. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. As I say, the, there are people in the room who actually know more than I do about this, so shut up. Um, <laughs> we don't want to hear from you. Uh, Samba Cry. Um, again, there are people in the room who know much more about this. That was probably the worst single security bug I've ever had to deal with, you know, or we've ever had to deal with in a project. Um, and then um, being fed into the mincing machine, uh, we had Google Project Zero uh, report a bug. And uh, I I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what happened there. Um, that was an interesting experience. So bad, bad, bad luck. Um, so bad luck. It's actually a protocol level vulnerability. These are the kind of things that you wake up in the middle of the night screaming about. Uh, they're just terrifying. Essentially, it's a man in the middle downgrade attack against any DC or PC connection. Uh, and that is the main, um, it's the uh, technology used by all Windows remote procedure call um, uh, at the time, most Microsoft interoperating products. It was complex to understand, which is, this is the worst case scenario, right? It was a complicated bug. You had to understand some of the crypto to figure it out. And almost nobody, except the people who were actually writing the code, understood what it was. Um, and I believe, uh, does anyone remember the Italian security company that essentially got wiped out by their entire cache of emails being released to the world? I believe, I don't have 100% proof, there was something posted to Pastebin. Uh, I believe it was a downgrade attack of Badlock where somebody hijacked one of their internet facing routers, installed a DC on it, and, or, or installed a, something that pretended to be a domain controller did a man-in-the-middle attack and downloaded their entire password database. Um, the exploit that, that, that one of the team members created, um, um, actually, he's not here, so I can, I, can, I can give him full credit for it, was Metz. He had a, a beautiful, beautiful, uh, I think it was about three or 500 line Python program that basically popped up on the network, said, hey, I'm your domain controller, talk to me. Um, Man in the middle did talked to the real domain controller, added a private administrator access uh, account, downloaded the entire password database, uh, and because he's German and very polite, deleted the um, uh, account that he'd used so that nobody would ever know he was there, and you know exfiltrate the entire password database of a domain controller. So, um, how did how did how was it discovered? It was actually discovered during a, a Microsoft Interop event uh, up in Redmond. Um, by a the, the rock that was kicked over that discovered that discovered this thing was uh, Metz actually deserves the credit, but the the story is a little interesting. Um, we were up at a Microsoft Interop event. Uh, somebody was fuzzing against the uh, RPC code, and Samba crashed. Happens. Uh, I was sat there with uh, another a Red Hat engineer, Alexander Bokovoy. We looked at the code. It was a null pointer in direction, pretty common in C, stupid flaw, denial of service at the worst, a one line fix, oh, make sure this is not null, fixed. And Alexander looked over it and said, yeah, that's good, pushed it, done. Okay, right, now on to the next bug. 3 a.m. That, that morning, I woke up and thought, that pointer can never be null. There's no code path that allows that pointer to be null. It's just, it's just not possible. Next day, um, I email Metz, talked about it, Metz went away as he does. Um, about eight hours later, he comes back, he says, it's worse than that. <laughs> and that's how the discovery started. He started looking at code that had been written a long time ago that implemented something extraordinarily complex, and yeah. So this was not long after Heartbleed. Anyone remember Heartbleed, the wonderful logo, all, the, all this kind of stuff? So, and this is my fault, absolutely. I, I blame myself for this completely. I was chatting with someone who I'm not going to name, and I basically said, wow, this is, this is a great security bug. And you know, 
credit is needed for this kind of thing, and oh, a heart bleed came out, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe do some marketing around it. Never, ever, ever do this. Never do this. This is so dumb, it's so stupid, and it's my fault I brought it up. So it got a name. Sorry? Yes, it, it, it got a name, it got a logo. It didn't have a theme song, but I believe the musical is coming out soon. Um, yeah. So, this is a protocol level bug. It affected absolutely everybody. Everybody doing storage, SMB storage, has to implement DCRPC uh, to be able to do uh, SID to name translation and other things. It affected absolutely everybody's storage stack. And so we had to start telling people about it. Knowledge of this thing started to leak. I'm, I don't have absolute proof from that, but I, from the administrator of our bugzilla, he started to notice some very strange activity of people trying to get access to the bugzilla. Um, and I started getting, a few months into this, I started getting some really strange phone calls of people saying, oh, I've heard about this bug. Can you tell me? You know? and, and at that point, I. I stopped responding to phone calls until I, uh, unless I actually knew that the person on the other end was someone I'd personally met at Sneer or, or Samber XP or whatever, and was someone I was, I actually remembered their face. Um, it took seven months because it had to be coordinated across Microsoft, Apple, NetApp, EMC, every storage vendor using Samba, and it's a complete disaster. Had that been discovered, by a project that insists on 90-day vulnerabilities, we would have been dead in the water. There was no way this could have been fixed in that time. Just not possible. Um, so this was this was like the worst case scenario. If, if Project Zero had done this, there would be no, no discussion 90 days, all active directories being taken over. So the, the comment was, if it, Project Zero had done a 90-day release, Essentially, Active Directory would have been dead in the water. It would have been all Active Directory domain controllers would have been vulnerable and password stolen. Um, this is a very and bad. They wouldn't have com compromised on this. Uh, I, I, I can't comment on whether whether this was would have been a special case or not. There's um, some cases where they haven't been willing to compromise. Yeah, there, that doesn't mean that yeah. there, are, there aren't cases where they won't. Yes, um, I, I think if you look at um, the Intel uh, Meltdown and Spectre bugs, I believe there may have been compromise there, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not on that team, um, but yeah, I, I'm just saying 90 days was not possible for this kind of bug. Um, yes, it was. So here's the, um, here was the disaster. Nobody understood it. Nobody understood the fix. Um, the press completely reported it badly because of my mistakes around the marketing. It was hyped and then um, the, the, you had the hype train and then the utter disappointment. Um, people accused Mets of deliberately, before they, while the bug was named but not known, people accused Mets of deliberately putting the bug in Samba and then getting paid to fix it. <laughs> um, you know, it was, we, which he was not, no. Um, it was hard to get management support because it was hard to explain to them. Uh, don't, as I say, don't don't do the names and logos for bug things. It's it, it you know, you have to get burned by that to realise how bad an idea it is. But just fix the bug. Nobody will thank you for it, but just fix it anyway. Um, marketing around around securities is not a great idea. Um, so. <laughs> I love this comment. <laughs> Samba Cry. So any, anyone remember WannaCry, the, the death of SMB1? Hooray. So WannaCry was an absolutely catastrophic SMB1 vulnerability in the Windows SMB1 server. Um, it's very interesting um, what it was. Uh, it was used by various three-letter agencies. Um, in Anyway, um, caused a lot of trouble. And then later on, <laughs> uh, we had a bug, and I, I love that quote. The guy, uh, when, he, when he saw what the bug was, he said, uh, you know, Microsoft SMB, what a week, Samba, hold my beer. <laughs> this, it, it wasn't, I mean, bad luck was, was, was bad. This was worse in a way, it was so much easier to exploit. Um, this was the worst bug I think we've ever had. Uh, and 
I reviewed the code <laughs> that created it. Um, so anyway, so we inside Samba we have two secure subsystems. We have the name pipe RPC services, and we have module loading for backend VFS modules and various other things. And what happened was, in order to create dynamic named pipes, some code was added that connected the two subsystems without thinking about the consequences. And I looked at that and thought, hey, that's a great idea. <laughs> wow, that's so, that's so elegant. OK, the patch. It was sat there for seven years, um, and a security researcher finally externally reported it. We don't know how much uh, it, it had been exploited. What did it allow you to do? So especially if you're running on Linux, what it allowed you to do was to create a shared library, you know, write some C code, create a shared library. You could upload it to any share that had write access, and then you could send a special RPC message to the Samba server, which is running as administrator or root, or, you know, that said, oh, see this share library on this share? Run that for me, will you? <laughs> as root, and the server will go, oh, sure, no problem. Um, so it was a one-line fix uh, for the change. Um, that genuinely was a one-line fix, you know, no other places. Um, but it was an utter, utter disaster. Uh, so the worst bug I, we've ever had. And it was not obvious. Uh, it was not easy to... So, so better, I say better security view would have caught this. Maybe, maybe it would, maybe not. Uh, like I say, two independent subsystems being connected together. Uh, essentially, this is one of the things where experience, we weren't experienced enough. More experience would teach us, hey, you've got these two subsystems that have never been connected before. If you're plugging them together, maybe look at that a little more carefully and think about it. Um, a safer language, Rust or whatever, or Go, or you know, writing summary and forth, that would not have helped would not have fixed this. It was a logic error. And these are the worst. And so essentially, Samba is a successful project in that we don't have that many dumb language errors anymore. We do. We have the occasional crash. and you know, But these are at worst denial of services. The really, really bad bugs, I've come to realize, are logic errors when concepts uh, have been added together that you don't understand. Um, tests wouldn't have caught it. Oh, I better hurry up. Um, all it would have shown, all the tests would have shown was either, yes, I loaded a, a, a name pipe library, or no, I didn't. You know, the, the flaw was in the concept itself, not in the actual code. The code was great. I reviewed it. Um, so the worst thing for us was the fact that there's a lot of Samba out there that will never, ever get upgraded. All of those routers that have old versions of Samba on it, that's built, baked into the firmware, um, you know, if you are the lesson from this, I guess, is if you're building a storage product, please don't abandon where it. Don't sort of say, okay, well, this is the firmware, we're fixing it in place, we're never going to update this. At least think of a way that you can cope with catastrophic security problems like this. Because worst case scenario, your entire box is compromised. And as an industry, blah, 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 yeah, it was our fault. I'm sorry. Um, so here was our... our Real experience with Google. The third one is our real experience with Google Project Zero. So I, I'm quite proud of the fact that it was, it was the guy who found the Meltdown and Spectre attacks, the famous Jan Horn. He was the guy who beat up Samba first. He practiced on us. So I, feel, I feel good about that. You know, he cut his teeth on us. Uh, he didn't even know I was a Google employee. He just mailed the Samba security and basically said, you guys suck, and here's why. Um, having said that, <sighs> My initial instinct was to kind of push back. This is one of those cases where old code, you know it well enough, it's kind of like there are some issues that you don't want to think about. You're like, like, well, I know this kind of works. So you've got this pile of dirt under the rug that you've been sweeping there for some years. And you think, ah, yeah, OK, maybe, maybe we should do something about that sometime. Um, so Jan came along and he basically showed that, <sighs> this is what I call a borderline exploit. He had to run the Samba server under S-Trace. If anyone doesn't know, S-Trace is a utility that runs as root, uh, attaches to a process, and traces every single system call. When you do that, it slows, down, slows the process down by a factor of 10. 
So it's a reliable way of slowing something down. Now, the only way he could never reproduce it if he ran the processes at full speed. Um, but if he ran it under S-trace, he could reproduce a race condition that allowed paths, allowed symlink paths to escape the share. This has actually had a great knock-on effect in the SMB2 Unix extensions design, and this is the reason why, um, at least in the Samba implementation, we do not allow SMB2 Unix extensions to create symlinks on the server. The server follows symlinks anymore. Um, so I don't know if other servers have this. I, 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 I look at Ganesha as a big pile of other code and think, you know, they, um, they must have this bug. Anyway, um, it's a generic flaw in following path names in user space. Um, so what was the fix? First fix took me about two weeks. My, my initial fix to, to fix it, my initial idea to fix it, turned out to be covered by a software patent. Just one another great way software patents improve the industry. Um, so I couldn't use that. Um, we found a better solution that was actually not covered by a patent. And so I coded that up. It took me two weeks. Everything worked. I thought, this is great. It's a complex bug, but I've managed to fix it. Then I ran all the tests, and a boatload of things started failing that didn't fail before with this code in place. And the, the thing that really, really failed was the snapshot processing module, the thing that does the volume shadow copies on Samba. And the reason it failed, uh, and that, that, that module was actually written directly for, for the benefit of and on behalf of the company who owned the goddamn patent. <laughs> so anyway, it broke the critical VFS module, and um, it took me a long time to actually go through that. I, I essentially had to f fix the module to rewrite the logic of the module. And in order to do that, what I had to do was trickle the patches out because uh, it, was, it was too big of a change to put in one security fix. So what I had to do was essentially start leaking patches that restructured the module first, getting those in place, then I could put the, the actual fix on top. Okay, five minutes to go. Ultimately, it took the full nine day disclosure time plus we groveled and got a 14 day extension. Um, and it got created, backported, tested, yeah, a few minor issues with older versions, but we mostly did it. Um, and that's when I learned that trying to do security cr critical work under that kind of time pressure is a really bad idea. It's when you can screw things up, it's when mistakes happen. So, you know, they deadlines are great in that they ensure that you actually take it seriously and you put concentrated effort into it, but they can also really screw you over. So, um, so um, you know, when you're designing stuff, try to ensure all the combinations of your design to try and fail safe. And I know this is impossible. It's like, write better code. Yeah, I know. Um, but there are things you can do. You can code in a fail-safe way. If when you're doing a design, you have a bad feeling about some of the logic around it, that's a signal, that's a sign for an experienced engineer that you're probably doing something wrong. And whenever you do something wrong, it may end up as a security bug. And, and just because you, you write this and you think, well, you know, there's, there's a race condition between this call and this call. Yeah, theoretically it could happen, but that'll have happened in real life. Somebody will find a way to make it happen. You know, I, I could have pushed back and said, well, it's impossible to reproduce this in the real world, and therefore I'm not going to consider it a security fix. But I knew better than that. A heavily loaded server, theoretically, it might happen. Could it have been reproduced in the real world reliably? Probably not. But it was bad enough that we had to do something and we had to fix it properly. Um, so design flaws like this are, are really the hardest to fix. And, and don't... <laughs> Even if you're right and you know you're right, don't try and argue with security people because they're insane. Um, just, just say, oh, okay, yes, this is a problem, we'll work with it. You know, sometimes you can, 
if it's a really obscure thing that's really hard to be reproduced, maybe you can get away with a mitigation method. You say, okay, well, configure it like this, it doesn't happen. You know, we, we have an explicitly insecure mode for Simlinks where you say, hey, we'll follow them anywhere all over the chair. If you want to have an insecure server, turn this on. I mean, that's, you know, um, we've never removed that option because there are some people who, who say, if you remove that option, my entire setup will break. Your setup's insecure, but that's the way you wanted it. And you know, don't be embarrassed to beg and grovel. It, it, it's only your pride and, and you know, pride and ownership and pride of work. It's nothing valuable. <laughs> if they'll give you more time, it's worth it. Um, it's worse to have them announce Project X is an unfixable security mess uh, than to say, yes, I know we're really bad. Please help us. Please give us more time. I'd rather do that than, than have the bad press. Um, so. <laughs> Nobody cares about security. I was going to say it until they don't have it. Yeah, even then, not so much. They just don't. This is a thankless job. Nobody cares. <laughs> I love this. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember whether this was Samba Cry or Bad Lock. It was one of them. That's, that's not the only time that quote has been. Yes, uh, a flaw in Microsoft's implementation of the Samba protocol. Ah. Great, hey man, we can finally get in credit. Um, people are gonna call you idiots, they're gonna call you stupid. Um, personal contacts and reputation are key for doing this right. And you know, if you remember nothing, just remember this. Doing security is like, is like being a plumber when the toilet is overflowing. It's no, nobody notices until the toilet's overflowing. And then you really, really have to do something about it. And, and nobody likes you for doing that. You know, even the person who came and, and cleared the blockage, you know, you're never going to invite them around for drinks afterwards for, hey, thanks for clearing my blockage. You know, you just, you pay them and make them go away. It's like, I don't, I don't want to think about that ever again. And, and security work is, is pretty much like that. Um, so prepare for failure, because <laughs> it will happen. Um, and at least that way you're not stuck going, oh my God, what do we do? Chicken with no head mode. Uh, you have a plan. You can do something about it. You know, you, you have prepared for a security vulnerability and the press coming out with completely insane quotes that, meet, that are, are crazy about your project and code. Respond to everything, even if it's people who are quite possibly nuts. Because some of those people, they may be nuts and very, very poor at communication, but they may also be right in terms of finding a security hole. We've, we've had that, or out of time. Test everything, and there's no magic language. Rust, Go, doesn't matter. You can create security flaws in any code. So um, I'm out of time, and questions? Any comments? Oh, man, I've bored everyone silly. Oh, yes, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, sometimes the upstream kernel maintainers uh, uh, it's too hard to fix this remote down kernel memory across the network. So we're not going to fix it. What do you do then? Um, so the question is, what do you do if the upstream project essentially refuses to fix the security flaw? Well, you have, you have two options. You can either rebase your product on an entirely new kernel, <laughs> or you can fix it yourself. And that's, you know, you have. Uh, that's when you have to make the damage assessment. Are customers going to stop? Are gonna, customers going to choose someone else, or does everyone else have the same problem that no one is going to fix? I mean, it's like, it's like the in, as as Corey Doctorow put it, the the Intel um, Intel processors have a tiny homunculus computer that lives inside their CPUs, that has security flaws, and you know. Your only option then is to say, right, well, we're going to buy AMD or ARM or whatever, but who's to say that they don't have a nasty little homunculus computer running to do exactly the same thing? Some, some flaws are, are bigger than you and your products. Um, so you, you do the best you can. And you know, um, essentially, it, it's like the common, you know, if you own the bank a million dollars, you're in trouble. Um, if you owe the bank several billion dollars, the bank's in trouble. <laughs> so. You know, just just don't be. When you're too big to fail, security problems don't matter. So, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>